It's a pleasure to be here at the first Pan IIT uh, Bay Area Conference and uh, delighted to talk to you. So my talk today is going to be about leadership in a variety of different ways, but mainly personal lessons learned over the last 40 years. And I really want to begin by asking how many times you've heard people use this expression, he's a born leader. We hear this again and again, and no matter how many times it's repeated, it's still not true. This statement is one of the big falsehoods uh, in leadership. Uh, I, I personally believe leaders are made and not born. And all of you in the room here who are either currently or aspiring leaders certainly prove that leadership is made. And I'm personally, in many ways, living proof that uh, leadership is made and leaders are not born. Henry Kissinger said that the task of a leader is to take people from where they are today to where they should go. And that's an easy statement to make. It's very simplistic. What he didn't say was where they should actually go and when they should go. Similarly, Dwight Eisenhower said that leadership is the art of getting people to do what you want them to do by making them want to do it themselves he, too, took a very simplistic road by not explaining the how. How do you get people to want to do what you want them to do, thereby making you a leader? So there are many different theories of leadership. Some of these theories confuse leadership with management. But my conclusion is that leadership is actually a journey. You're not born a leader. You start the journey somewhere. In my particular case, it was IIT Bombay. This leadership journey evolves. And as time goes on, hopefully you become a better and better leader and a more and more complete leader. So that's what I'll be talking about today. But before I talk about my own journey, I thought it might be helpful to share with you some of the more theoretical definitions and aspects of leadership so we can frame the way other people think about leadership, and then I'll frame the way I think about leadership. So if you look at various books on leadership, the first thing is the definition. Uh, the definition of leadership is the ability to lead a person, a team, or an organization. That seems to me to be very circular, right? So what does it mean to lead a team or an organization and you're back to the whole issue of what is leadership. Then there are theories that leadership is about the innate qualities or the innate attributes or traits that we have. And these traits, to be a leader, need to include such things as perseverance, self-confidence, assertiveness, uh, knowledge, uh, self-awareness, uh, various kinds of expertise. And it seems to me that these are all important, that these are all pre-qualifications for being a leader. You certainly can't be a good leader without them. But it also strikes me that this is not a complete definition, because there is a lot more to leadership than just having these basic qualities. Uh, by this theory, everyone who graduates you know, from a good school or college in India, not just an IIT, uh, just by the select selection process that they've gone through to get admitted and graduate is automatically a leader because most of them have these qualities, but that's not the case. Everyone with these qualities is not a leader, though these qualities are, in fact, very important pre-qualifications. Similarly, there are theories about situational leadership where you can be a leader in one context, for example, the military, and then fail as a leader in civilian, uh, in civilian life. You can be a leader in the moral context. You can fail to be a leader in the political context. You can be a successful leader in a startup, but you may be a failed leader in a company of scale. So this whole notion of situation and context is important to the whole definition of leadership. But that, too, is not a complete view. There's a more recent view of leadership which is called sort of this integrated psychological view of three layers of leadership, where you have 
personal leadership, certain qualities there. You have private leadership, where it's a one-to-one -one relationship with someone that you're leading, certain additional qualities there. And you have public leadership, where you are managing groups of people in the public context. You have other qualities. But again, when I looked at those qualities, I was not that impressed with the, with the theory. So instead, I thought I would share my own experience and in each of my experiences to translate them into a particular quality of leadership that I've learned through that experience. And in doing so, also to separate and distinguish what it means to be a leader as compared to what it means to be a manager. So leadership to me is all about passion. And passion is to leadership what effort is to management. So a manager works hard, puts in the effort, but doesn't necessarily have the passion for what they're doing, whereas leaders have to have that passion. And passion is all about belief. Passion is about commitment. Passion is about energy. Passion is about creating excitement. And my journey into leadership began at IIT Bombay. And it started with passion, because when I left high school, I had passion for electronics, I had passion for rocketry. And when I started in IIT Bombay, 1964, one of the first questions I asked was whether there were any hobby clubs or societies in which I could participate that had something to do with electronics or rocketry. And there weren't any. I went to the, uh, the, you know, the director and the registrar of IIT Bombay and asked if they were planning any such thing. They weren't. They had zero interest in anything other than just basic classroom education. And uh, I decided that that wasn't good enough. And I started collecting a group of friends who had similar passions and similar interests. In one case, a group of people interested in electronics. In another case, a group of uh, students interested in rocketry. And we put this rocketry group together, and I'll use them as an example. And we started building the first rockets in India. Now, building a rocket is far more complicated than it looks. Uh, you have to figure out the fuel. You have to figure out the, you know, the mechanical structure of the rocket, the dimensions, the nozzle. Uh, these are not, you know, parts that you can just go buy in the open market and keep in India. This is, uh, this is now 1965 uh, in India, uh, so not the easiest thing to do. So we started from scratch. Uh, we built our own rocket tubes to contain the fuel. We went to the machine shop, uh, designed the nozzles. Uh, we copied the design from rocket designs of Rob Robert Goddard that had been published in magazines like Popular Science and Popular Mechanics. and various books on rocketry. So it was truly textbook learning, the hard way. Uh, and we fired the first rocket. Uh, it was a painful experience. It exploded. Uh, we then built the second rocket. We fired the second rocket. It was a lot more successful. Actually went up 100 feet in the air and then collapsed. Uh, but through that journey, we began, this group of students began to get a reputation for doing you know, creative, innovative things. Uh, so that was the good side. The bad side was somehow, and I still don't know how, the Bombay police also found out that there were a group of guys at IIT Bombay who were building rockets. This is 1965. The war had just started between India and Pakistan. Uh, most of you may be too young to remember that it happened in 65, but it did. So of course, the police were concerned that we were all saboteurs uh, firing rockets or planning to fire rockets into the city of Bombay and wipe out the population of Bombay. By the way, this is before terrorism was a big buzzword. So just you know, all of us who were 16, 17 years old at that time uh, were actually charged with sedition and you know, various kinds of uh, uh, violation of various kinds of laws. Uh, and, and actually, the administration of IIT Bombay got involved. They were all very alarmed. They, so long story short, uh, uh, we were released. <laughs> uh, we were asked never to fire a rocket into the air, uh, though we got permission to fire a rocket into the ground. 
the police decided that firing a rocket into the ground is quite safe and would not affect the war with Pakistan. So what are you going to do? We built a thrust stand, put the rocket the other way down, nose cone facing towards the ground, and fired a half dozen rockets over the next two years and took various measurements on you know, thrust versus nozzle dimensions versus size of rocket versus fuel. And we were among the first people in India to create zinc oxide as the solid fuel for these rockets. Um, um, unknowingly, we nearly exploded uh, you know, the fuel in the presence of a whole bunch of people. But fortunately, the accident didn't happen. But through this, uh, lots of lessons were learned. And many of the kids who were there went on to the Indian Space and Research Organization in Bangalore. So there's at least some seed of truth to the statement that ISRO may, own, uh, may owe its uh, success and its existence to some of that early work that this little group of guys did at IIT Bombay. However, the main point of the story is because of passion, we engaged in this activity. And at the end of all this, as we were firing rockets into the ground, the administration finally realized this was really stupid that they needed a more organized way for uh, orchestrating student activities. And that led to the creation of the Electronic Society and the Rocketry Society, and then ultimately a whole bunch of societies. That ultimately led to um, various kinds of uh, variety programs on campus. So I, I was social secretary. I helped set up the first uh, variety show at IIT Bombay. And that's now become Mood Indigo you know, 40 years later. So uh, that was the start of my journey in leadership, because to ultimately achieve what we did, and by the way, I didn't know that this kind of activity was called leadership. We didn't have a name for it. We were just doing stuff we were passionate about. But ultimately, this was really all about getting a group of people uh, aligned around a common purpose, getting the administration to support that purpose, getting the administration to institutionalize that purpose, Today, people would call that leadership. In those days, we didn't have a name for it. The next big aspect of leadership is trust. And trust is to leadership what respect is to management. Managers have to be respected, but leaders need to be trusted. And trust is what causes followers to follow. It's what causes believers to believe. And trust is not something you earn overnight. So trust is the result of a long accumulation of things that you do in your life that makes people believe that when you have a vision, you are going to see it through for the long term. That when you make a commitment to customers and employees and shareholders and community, you are going to see it through for the long term. And when you engage with people that they can look up to you, that they can see through example the way in which they themselves should change their behavior, these are all the different kinds of things that go into this very amorphous thing and this very fragile thing called trust. So my journey in Understanding the importance of trust as a key dimension of leadership was with one of my first companies, which was American Robot in Pittsburgh. And one year after starting American Robot with the mission of trying to make it one of the leading robotics companies in the world, I concluded that we had a flawed business model. We had a flawed business model because the Japanese had just begun to dump robots into the US at a selling price that was far less than our out-of-pocket manufacturing cost. <clears throat> However, on the basis of my early reputation, I had raised about $43 million in venture capital. Much of that had been invested into plant and equipment and inventory and a variety of other things to build this robotics company. And it was one of those decisions where you know, today someone might say, well, why don't you fail fast? Well, fail, failing fast might be a very convenient and a very opportunistic thing to do. Failing fast is not the way you build great leadership qualities and you don't build trust. 
I decided to stick it out. And it took me nine more years waking up every morning knowing that I had a fundamentally flawed business model. But during those nine years, transforming the business entirely from being a robotics company to becoming a computer integrated manufacturing software company and taking the value of the investment that venture capital firms had put into the company uh, from a potential value of zero to something that was in the many tens of millions of dollars, less than 43 million, so our VCs did not get all their money back. But they all got back a lot more than they would have if I had simply given up on the company. Not to mention all the customers that we would have burned, all the employees that we would have burned, I just didn't feel it was the right thing to do. And when I look back at the, uh, at the balance of scales here, on the one side, if I look at it purely financially, as many people do in Silicon Valley, it was an absolutely catastrophic decision to make. I was working 80 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, 4,000 hours a year, 10 years, 40,000 hours, and I made about $400,000. Last time I checked, that's uh, $10 an hour. And uh, of course, you can be flipping burgers at uh, McDonald's and probably make 10 bucks an hour. Because I'm a good worker, I'd have probably gotten a bonus from McDonald's. So that was the dark side. The plus side was it taught me an unforgettable lesson about the importance of trust in leadership. Because everything I've done since American Robot is all the result of the fact that I've never been willing to take the easy road. I've never been willing to give up. I've never been willing to sort of, uh, uh, you know, burn all the people who worked with me in helping create something. I've always felt that once you start something, unless you're defying the laws of physics, or you wake up one day and you find that what you do is absolutely physically impossible, giving up is just not an option. Now, the third major dimension of leadership for me is about inspiration. It's about the ability to inspire others. You can do that by setting a very powerful vision. You can do that by articulating a very big purpose. You can do that by uh, creating an emotional connection. You can do that by somehow sparking creativity, enabling creativity. There are many different ways in which you can go about inspiring people. But inspiration is to leadership what planning is to management. So as many of you are managers in very important companies in the Bay Area, you all do planning. Inspiration is different. Inspiration is about something bigger. It's about creating a bigger sense of purpose, about creating a bigger sense of uh, vision, and goes beyond what we do as managers in our everyday lives. So one of the key aspects of inspiration is the ability to inspire people when times are not good. Anyone can inspire people when things are going well. It doesn't take much. Uh, you know, it's uh, like Vijay Malia said, you can be the king of good times. Uh, but it's actually when times are not good and things turn adverse that true leadership stands out. And my experience uh, in that came when I, uh, after I started aspect development in uh, Silicon Valley. So after my first two companies, I moved here in 1991, uh, started Aspect Development. Aspect was one of the first companies to actually integrate large amounts of content with software to, to provide analytic solutions and insights for the supply chain. And uh, today, that would be called big data working with software. In those days, it was just content. Uh, and over the years, Aspect started to become a very successful company. In 1996, we went public. Our public market valuation then was about $500 million. And the stock climbed. And at one point in uh, the end of 1998, uh, the stock reached a value of $60 a share, which would have been about $2.5 billion. Now, clearly, that high valuation was not fully justified by the performance of the company. It was partly the high performance of the company, but mostly 
the building of the bubble, the technology bubble that you saw happen in 98, 99, 2000, 2001. But Q199 comes around, and on March 31st, 99, we missed the quarter. We had expected to win three major deals. We were a public company, three major deals, any one of which would have allowed us to make the quarter. None of those three deals came in on March 31st. They all came in between April and May. So a 30, 60 day slip in winning these big deals with companies like Motorola and Emerson Electric led to a collapse of our stock price from $60 a share to $6 a share. This happened in about two weeks. And uh, one of the big challenges for me was how do you preserve the organization? How do you continue to earn uh, the, the mantle of leadership from all the people who work for you and all the customers who put their faith in you? And that led to, uh, 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 I would say, a 24 by 7, two week period in which I completely redefined the vision of the company going forward. I developed a three year roadmap for rebuilding the company around certain new products, new technologies, new go to market uh, approaches, with the hope that three years later, uh, the value of the stock might recover from $6 to $100 and therefore make the option value for our employees whole, uh, make our customers feel that we were a stable company that would be around for a long time to come. And uh, that was a time, uh, Q1, Q2, 99, when virtually every person we had in the company had five or six job offers from others. It was a time when like now, talent was very scarce, and uh, it, it would have been just absolutely easy for any of them to leave, but perhaps, perhaps, because they were inspired by the new vision, perhaps because they were inspired by the roadmap and my own commitment, and perhaps they were inspired by the fact that I decided to give this talk to our employees wearing a T-shirt and torn jeans, uh, to reflect that we were all in the trenches together, uh, everyone stayed. And the end result was during that magical 12-month period, our revenues grew 60%. Our stock price went from $6 a share to $15 a share to $30 a share to $60 a share to $200 a share. And then I2 came along and bought us for $236 a share. And I2 brought us exactly 10 months after I gave this talk to the employees. But it wasn't just a talk. It was a true belief in that vision. And then we began to execute that vision. And it was the combination of the vision and the execution and the fact that all the employees stayed with us and the fact that all the customers stayed with us that made all this possible. So that's the power of inspiration as a key element of leadership. The fourth lesson that I've learned is about influence. And influence can be achieved in a variety of different ways, but one of the best ways is through shared values. And influence is to leadership what control is to management. So if you're a manager, you have a team that works for you, 10 people or 10,000 people, you have complete command and control ability to get them to do what you want them to do, or at least to hope that they will do what you want them to do. Influence is different. It's about how you use your values, your ability to mentor, your ability to guide, your ability to challenge, your ability to push, your ability to pull, and to do all this with, a, with the goal of making things better for your team, your organization, or your community. And this is a lesson that I've learned at Symphony Technology Group, which is the group that I started about 12 years ago. And the mission of Symphony Technology Group sounds very simple. It's to build a bunch of great companies at the intersection of data, analytics, and software in different vertical sectors of the economy. 
And over the last 12 years, I've built the group from startup to $2.7 billion in revenue this year and 15,000 employees. Uh, we have companies, a group of companies that serve retailers and brands. We have a group of companies that serve the healthcare ecosystem. We have a group of companies in the talent acquisition solution space. And all this is uh, uh, not possible to do just through control because each of our companies has a CEO, has a management team, and I have to work by influencing them, and the way I influence them is by setting a common set of values at the symphony group level, and then by getting each of our management teams to adopt those values and uh, live those values every single day. And I think that's one of the main reasons why Symphony Technology Group has grown the way it has and has you know, the potential for success that it seems to have. A fifth key dimension of leadership, and in my view, perhaps the most important dimension, is about giving. And giving is to leadership what demanding is to management. So managers demand, leaders give. And you can give in a variety of different ways. You can give time, you can give energy, you can give money, you can give to the person who works for you, the team that works for you, the organization that you're part of, the community that you're part of. And one of the ways of giving is philanthropy. <coughs> so about 12 years ago, I reached the conclusion that while I had given everything I had to give to our companies, I had given relatively little of myself to the community. And so I started the Vadwani Foundation. And the mission of the Vadwani Foundation is to give away 90% of my net worth, much of it hopefully during my lifetime. And the focus of the foundation is around uh, accelerating economic development through job creation, and job creation through the combination of accelerating entrepreneurship, innovation, and skilling. And of all the things I've done, I have to tell you that it's been one of the most fulfilling. So when I look at all these things taken together, let me just close by saying that you are the elite of the elite, right? Just to get into the IITs that you got into, you were in the top 1% or the top 0.1% of all Indian students who applied. And you're not just in the IITs. You're IITians who are in the Bay Area. So you are a further selected elite subset of that 0.1% that got into the IITs in the first place. You all have the prerequisites for leadership. We talked about them, you know, self-confidence, assertiveness, know-how, problem-solving ability, you name it, you've got it. I'm not going to belabor those. But to be a true leader, it's all about passion. It's not about effort. It's all about trust. It's not just about respect. It's about inspiration. It's not just about management planning. It's about influence. It's not just about control. And most of all, it's about giving. So I think all of you have the opportunity to be, and I fully expect you to become the great leaders of the future in the Bay Area and beyond. And good luck, and thank you. <laughs>